Kathy Glass. Kathy Glass was a 31-year-old woman who lived in Cobb County, Georgia in 1991. She worked at the Country Pines apartment off of South Cobb Drive. In May of 1991, Kathy's neighbors heard noises coming from Kathy's apartment on Booth Road in Marietta. Hearing the noises, the neighbors called police. When the officers arrived at 15 Booth Road, they found Kathy's body lying in her apartment in a pool of blood. Her apartment had been ransacked. Included among the evidence collected at the scene was a palm print. At the time of the crime, the print did not match anyone in the law enforcement database. Police would question her friends and family, but nothing came of it. They also questioned neighbors, who said that they had heard loud noises coming from the apartment, but did not see anyone come in or out of the apartment. Police would continue their investigation, but with no leads and no suspects, the case would eventually grow cold. The case was reopened in 2014. Then, in the summer of 2019, the detective working the case, while sorting through the evidence of Kathy's case, spotted a palm print in one of the crime scene photos. At the time of Kathy's murder, the database only included fingerprints, but only recently, the automated fingerprint identification system recently expanded its records to include palm prints. The detective decided to send the palm print for testing. This time, the palm print matched a 55-year-old man named Trent Allen Brown. Trent was arrested on charges of malice murder, aggravated assault, and burglary. He was already in jail in Indiana for burglary. He had had a long rap sheet that included forgery, theft, counterfeiting, and receiving stolen property. His latest conviction and sentencing happened in 2018, with a release date of September 1, 2021, but he will most likely find himself behind bars for much longer if he is found guilty of Kathy's murder. Terry Lynn Hollis In 1972, 11-year-old Terry Lynn Hollis was living with her family in Torrance, California. On Thanksgiving Day, November 23, 1972, Terry went to play outside on her bike at around 3 p.m. She would never return home. When Terry did not return home that night, her family reported her missing. The police would search around the neighborhood that night, but they could not find her. The next day, a fisherman found her body over 70 miles away wearing only a t-shirt. Autopsy later revealed that she had been sexually assaulted and choked to death. Her body was then dumped on a cliff below the Pacific Coast Highway in Oxnard. Police believed that while on a bike ride, Terry was most likely abducted. Detectives conducted more than 2,000 interviews and searches in the local and surrounding areas in the hopes of finding any leads in the case, but nothing would turn up and the case would grow cold. In 2000, detectives would reopen the case and submitted DNA they had found at the crime scene for comparative testing to the combined DNA index system, but they did not receive any matches. In 2018, police submitted the DNA to Parabon Nanolabs, who conducted a genetic genealogy analysis on the DNA and found a potential match of the suspect's relative through a public database. That match led detectives to identify the suspect as Jake Edward Brown. Brown died in Arizona in 2003 and had previously been arrested for narcotics, robbery, and two rapes after Hollis's, one in April of 1973 and again in April of 1974. It is unclear whether he was convicted for those crimes, but police do believe he served some time in jail before he died of illness. Detectives exhumed his body and collected bone remains. Police used a company called DNA Labs International in Virginia to extract DNA and confirm that Jake Edward Brown was the killer. The case was finally solved after almost five decades. Pamela Milam Pamela Milam was a 19-year-old girl studying to become an English teacher at Indiana State University. She was a member of the Sigma Kappa sorority at Indiana State and lived with her parents and two sisters at their home about 10 minutes from the Indiana State University campus. In September of 1972, Pamela was staying at the Sigma Kappa suite at ISU's Lincoln Quad during sorority rush festivities. On September 15th, Pamela left Homestead Hall after a party to move her car closer to the dorm and told some of her sorority sisters she would return to the suite in a few minutes. She never returned. The next day, she missed her 8 a.m. shift at the library. No one had seen her all day. When no one had heard from her, she was reported missing. Pamela's parents would spend the whole day searching for her at the campus, to no avail. 
Around 7 p.m., two of her sorority sisters spotted her 1964 Pontiac parked about a block away from where it had been parked the day before. Her glasses were seen through the rear window of the car and her purse was in the back seat. About an hour later, Pamela's father arrived with a spare set of keys. When they opened the trunk of her car, they found Pamela's body. She had been bound with a clothesline and her mouth was gagged. The gag was held in place with a piece of white masking tape. She had bruises all over her body and she had wounds on her head and face. All of the items used to tie her up had been used at the rush party that Milam had been at earlier and were in a box of decorations she had been carrying to her car. A stick and other debris found between her pantyhose and pants indicated her pants had been removed at some point, likely in a wooded area. DNA was recovered from a stain left on her light blue blouse. An autopsy revealed she had died of strangulation. Police had no witnesses and no descriptions of who may have been responsible for her death. About seven weeks after the murder, a man named Robert Wayne Austin was arrested for a series of attempted and successful abductions on campus. Police said Austin would sexually assault the students and then return them to campus. Austin would eventually be convicted of rape, sodomy, and kidnapping and sentenced to life in prison. He denied having any involvement in Pamela's murder, however, and police were never able to find any clues that linked him to her murder. With no leads and no suspects, the case would go cold. In 2001, the Indiana State Police Lab analyzed the stain found on Pamela's blouse. Austin's DNA did not match the stain on the blouse. A fingerprint found on the door of Pamela's car also did not match Austin. The fingerprint was entered in the automated finger identification system, but did not receive a match. In 2008, Terre Haute Police Chief Sean Keene reopened the case. The clothesline used to bind Pamela helped to establish a partial DNA profile. Then, in 2018, a DNA sample was sent to Parabon Nanolabs in hopes of finding a potential suspect. The result came back with a potential family that the DNA might have come from. The family was investigated and further DNA samples were analyzed, and Jeffrey Lynn Hand was identified as the killer. DNA samples from Jeffrey's widow and his two sons helped link him to the stain found on Pamela's blouse. Jeffrey was 23 years old at the time of Pamela's murder. He had been convicted in 1973 for picking up a couple who were hitchhiking and murdering the husband. The woman was able to escape and call police from a neighboring house. Jeffrey was eventually found not guilty by reason of insanity, but was committed to the state reformatory until 1976. Then in 1976, Jeffrey was spotted trying to abduct a woman near a Kokomo shopping mall. A police officer witnessed it and a pursuit ensued. Jeffrey would eventually fire and injure the police officer. Another officer then shot and killed Jeffrey as he tried to run away. After 47 years, Pamela's family finally got some closure knowing the identity of her killer and his fate. Denise Sharon Kolb Denise Sharon Kolb was a 27-year-old woman who lived in Pennsylvania. In October in 1991, she would move in with her boyfriend, Theodore Dill Donahue, but just two weeks later, she would move out. Sometime after October 19, 1991, Denise would go missing. No one would report her missing. Then, on October 12, 1991, about a month later, her badly decomposed body would be found. Denise was discovered in a wooded, undeveloped cul-de-sac. She was found wearing only a sweater, but two pairs of pants, a t-shirt, jacket, and one pale yellow sock were discovered on top of the body. Because of the decomposition, the autopsy by a Delaware County medical examiner listed the manner of death as undetermined and unnatural, and the cause of death as probable asphyxiation. Her boyfriend, Theodore, was questioned, and he said he had last seen Denise on October 18, 1991, when the pair had bought and used crack cocaine together. He said that shortly after, a man had robbed them at knife point. He told authorities that Denise ran to get help, and he never saw her again. Denise's family members told police that they had last seen Denise on October 19th at a funeral. Denise's sister said that Denise had gotten into a fight with Theodore outside of the bar where she worked on October 19th. This was the last time she was seen alive. On the day Denise's body was discovered, Theodore returned all the clothes she had left behind at his apartment to her family before the family was notified of her death. 
During his interview with the police, Theodore admitted that his nickname was Ted Bundy. He was considered a strong suspect in the case, and police searched his apartment days later. During their search, they discovered a yellow sock that appeared to match the one found at the crime scene. At the time, Theodore insisted he had no knowledge or involvement in Denise's death. Eventually, the case would grow cold. The case would be reopened in 2015, and Theodore was re-interviewed. He admitted to police that he had lied in his original story, and he did see Denise outside the bar on October 19th. Phone records indicated that Theodore and Denise had spoken before they met on that day at the bar. Over the next few years, the police interviewed Theodore's family and friends. They would discover that Theodore had stayed at a motel that was just over a mile from the crime scene several times a year, and that he shared details about the crime scene that no one but the perpetrator and the police would know. During his interview in 1991, Theodore had asked police if Denise had been strangled, and he would call them twice more in 1991 to inquire about how she died. Authorities would never tell Theodore how she died, and no media accounts reported the cause of her death. In an interview, Lisa Campbell, who worked with Theodore at a restaurant in the 1990s, said that he had told her he had once had a roommate who died on the couch, and that he was questioned by police about the death. Quote, I found it odd. He acted like he got away with something, end quote. Another acquaintance, Amber Booth, who had been a roommate of Donahue's in 2012 when they worked at Golden Crust Pizza, reported that Donahue told her one day he had just returned from visiting a spot in the woods where a former girlfriend's body had been found. He said that the woman's name was Denise and that she was found face down, naked, with her legs spread, something that was never released to the public. Investigators then took another look at the sock that was found with Denise's body. The sock that was found at the crime scene was lost, so police, with the help from Temple University's photography department, enhanced the details of the sock in the image. The image of the sock was found to be a perfect match with the sock found in Theodore's apartment. Theodore was finally arrested on the 3rd of September, 2019, and charged with murder, abuse of a corpse, tampering with evidence, obstruction of justice, and false reports to the police. The Racine County Jane Doe On July 21st, 1999, a man and his teenage daughter were walking their dog in Raymond, Wisconsin. It had rained the previous night, and while walking, they noticed drag marks on the ground. Curious, they followed it to a cornfield where they stumbled upon the body of a deceased female. She appeared to have a broken arm, as it was sticking out at an odd angle. They alerted the local authorities, who rushed to the scene. An autopsy revealed that the woman had died from severe injuries. She had been starved, abused, and tortured for a long time before her death. She had received blunt force trauma to her head, had a broken nose, cuts on her head and on the bridge of her nose and forehead. She also suffered blunt force trauma to her chest, abdomen, wrists, hands, and fingers, and had numerous cuts all over her body. She had also been sexually assaulted. She had burns on more than 25% of her body, on her head, face, neck, arms, and upper torso. Her death was ruled to be the result of multiple homicidal injuries. She was estimated to be between the ages of 18 and 35 years old, and was most likely cognitively disabled. As it had rained the previous night, very little evidence of the perpetrator was found at the crime scene. When she was discovered, she was wearing a men's gray country shirt with embroidered red flowers on the front and snap buttons. She was also wearing black sweatpants and did not have shoes or socks on her. Over 50 people attended her funeral on October 27, 1999, after her autopsy. She was interred at Holy Family Cemetery in Caledonia, Wisconsin. Her gravestone read, Daughter, Jane Doe, along with the dates of discovery and burial, with the phrase, Gone but not forgotten. Detectives traveled to various homeless shelters throughout Wisconsin and spoke to pediatric and dental offices throughout the country. They also contacted agencies that worked with disabled children in hopes of finding any leads, but to no avail. Multiple facial reconstructions were created and distributed to the public in hopes of someone recognizing her. For 20 years, the Jane Doe, who came to be known as Racine County Jane Doe, or Crystal Ray, would remain unidentified.
On October 16, 2013, her body was exhumed and her remains were sent to the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner for chemical isotope testing. The test measures the natural variations in a body and helps determine where a person has spent significant time throughout their life. On October 20, 2016, it was announced that the chemical isotope testing performed by the Smithsonian on a sample of her hair and bone suggests that she may have originally been from or spent several years of her life in Alaska, Montana, or portions of southern Canada. Then, in September 2019, the Racine County Police received a tip from someone that a local woman was telling people that she had killed a woman back when she lived in Illinois in the 90s. The suspect would be identified as a 64-year-old nurse named Linda Sue LaRoche. And on November 8, 2019, Racine County authorities identified the victim through DNA comparison as Peggy Lynn Johnson, 23, of McHenry, Illinois. It was found that Peggy did not have any relatives and was never reported missing. Her mother, father, and brother were all dead by the 1990s. In the 90s, Peggy was about 18 years old, cognitively impaired and on her own when she went searching for help at a medical clinic in McHenry, Illinois. There she would meet a registered nurse, Linda LaRoche. Linda claimed that she had experience and was aware of the teenager's condition and took her into her home. According to Linda's children, she had taken Peggy in to work as a nanny and housekeeper in exchange for a place to live. Her children told police that her mother would physically, verbally, and emotionally abuse Peggy. Linda had allegedly once stabbed Peggy in the head with a pitchfork. When not working, Peggy was forced to live in the crawl space under the house. Investigators also talked to Linda's ex-husband, and he recalled that the last time he had seen Peggy was at their home when he found her lying on the ground, lifeless. Linda had told him that Peggy had overdosed and she was going to take her away from the house so that they would not be involved. Investigators interrogated Linda, and she admitted to abusing Peggy, but claimed Peggy would steal, have men come to see her at their house, and that she would go into the crawl space of their house to steal medications. She said one day Peggy was holding pills before she fainted. As she was a registered nurse, she didn't call the ambulance. Peggy eventually regained consciousness. Linda then claimed she couldn't tolerate Peggy anymore and took her to a nearby phone booth. She called Peggy's grandmother and then turned her over to her grandmother. But when the police confronted her that they had talked to Peggy's grandmother and that she had no idea who Linda was, she changed her story. She now claimed that she was not sure who the person was that Peggy left with. She would again change her story and said that she had abandoned Peggy while alive along the roadway in Wisconsin. Linda theorized that something must have happened to her after she had dropped her off. Police did not buy her story and she was arrested in Florida and charged with first degree intentional homicide and hiding a corpse. She has waived extradition and is in the process of being moved to Racine, Wisconsin to face trial. Arrangements are being made for Peggy to be laid to rest under her true identity and for her to be buried alongside her mother.